second session's title is uh, Chances Given to Us. Well, the world evangelization is our dream, final visions, and goal, whatever you use the terminology. Anyway, in a sense, the church, it is the uh, task of uh, every church as well as as each Christian. So it is our dream to complete the world evangelizations. Then here's a real crucial question. Is it possible to accomplish the world evangelization? Because the world evangelization is a two big concepts. So sometimes it's not tangible in our life. Is it really possible to accomplish the world evangelization someday? If it is possible, second question is that, where are we now? There's a two different answers. Some group says that we are learning the final phase of the race. As we turn in just to one more corner, then we can see the finish lines. Usually the fiery preachers say so. Then I ask them, why do you believe we are in the final stage of the race? The answers are very simple. I believe. I believe so. But there's another group to provide the different answers. They say that well, it is the promise of God to accomplish the world evangelizations. We grounded the uh, uh, promise of a world evangelizations on the Matthew twenty four fourteen. It says that, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So it is a promise of God. Someday, every nation, every people on earth will hear the good news of gospel. So they answered, we believe someday it will complete it, but it will take a long time. Never accomplished in a short time. Usually those guys are so-called scholars, Visualists, statistics. They provide many data about that. What the population, situation of different religions, and the situation of Christian churches, especially in the Western world. They said it would take a long time. So many times I asked the same questions. How do you think about it? My answer is quite simple. Both of them seem to be right. <laughs> so in this day, we say the world evangelization is in a crisis. In Chinese word, the crisis says like this one, two characters. Then it's a very interesting word. The first character of a Chinese word does mean the danger, risk. However, the second character does mean the chance. So when, when we say that we are in crisis, it doesn't mean that we are in a cross-section. Depend on our own responses. We can go to the, this way and the result in failure. However, depend on our responses, we can take another way, then we will achieve the success. So exactly, world evangelization is in crisis. Depend on our own response to the situation, we will succeed or we will fail. It doesn't mean that there's a two different factors, negative factors and affirmative factors to achieve the world evangelization today. To be a fair, I must talk about both of factors. 
But today, I want to give you more weight only to the affirmative factors, chances we have. There's two reasons. Number one is that we have a serious limit of time. <laughs> I have only 60 minutes. I spend only 10 minutes. And the number two, the chances given to us is actually much bigger than the challenges we face. If we can focus on the chances given to us, we can overcome the challenges. So I would like to focus on the affirmative factors, the chances given to us. However, never neglect the negative challenges to face us. For example, there are several challenges we have to face. Number one is population explosions. The biggest barrier to accomplish the world evangelization is population explosion, explosions. It's too big. So sometimes it's apparent, but uh, we do not notice of it. Population is growing so fast in these days. We use the word doubling time to measure the speed of uh, population increase. Dub doubling time does mean that how long is, does it take to double the population in the world? In the time of Jesus, there was uh, 160 million people lived in the, in the earth, 160 million only. Then it took uh, 1,200 years to double their population. Once they, it was doubled, suddenly it was accelerated. Next doubling time was only took 550 years. Next doubling time took only 140 years. And next one was only 70 years. And next one took only 38 years. So almost the end of 1999, well, the population reached the six billions. You look at those uh, uh, doubling times, it almost reduced the half or more than a half. Then easily we can expect next doubling time would be less than 20 years. But it doesn't work. The earth is almost uh, saturated began to retard the speed of uh, double the population. However, it's growing so fast yet. We expect uh, within next 60 years, the global population will reach up to the 12 billion. Right now, in the 2016, our population seems to be the uh, 7.45 billion. However, within the next 60 years, it will reach up to the 12 billions. You know what does it mean? If the speed of our evangelization cannot catch up the speed, increasing speed of world populations, what will be happened? Unfortunately, the Christian share of the world population will be decreased. We are in a danger to live in the fulfilled world evangelization. No, in a sense, we are in danger to reduce the Christian share in the world population. It is a reverse trend. It is a big challenge. Another one is that all world religions are growing not only Christianity. Islam is growing so fast, twice faster than the Christianity. Hinduism is growing. Of course, we do not scare their growth because the 95% of the growing factors of Muslim in the world comes from their natural growth. It means that they gave more ch birth to children in the world. It's the same thing happened to the Hinduism, whatever. Anyway, they are growing so fast. Another factor is that human suffering 
is increasing now. So many disasters and the terrorism, human trafficking, malnutrition, and the differences between the rich and poor. Anyway, we have so many problems. And the finally, each country s displayed a kind of a nationalism. They closed the door to the foreign missionaries. Those are big factors we have to overcome. However, we have a better chances. I want to ask you the one question to the pastors. I used to ask uh, this question to my students, those who already finished the course of a Christian church history. What was the greatest uh, revival period in the Christian history within the last 2,000 years? What was the greatest revival period of Christianity within the last 2,000 years? Well, Always there will pop up several different answers. Usually someone say, says like this, well, the first 400 years in church history. In a sense, that was correct. At the time of Jesus, the Christian ratio in the world seems to be almost zero. However, 400 years later, Christian ratio went up to the 23%. Within 400 years, one of every four people in the world became a Christian. Wow! But we do not give a credit on these statistics. At the time, world population was just 160 million. Then the population of the Roman Empire was 4 million, uh, 40 million. Then suddenly, Roman Empire accepted Christianity as their national religion. the scholars counted the whole population of the Roman Empire were Christian. But it's not exactly correct. Then someone says that, well, D.M. Moody passed, uh, minister, D.M. Moody's time seems to be the greatest revival. Someone says, no, no, Charles Finney. Someone says that, no, uh, instead of Charles Finney, they want to give more credit to the Spurgeon Someone said that John Wesley. I want to tell you the exact fact. What was the greatest revival period in the church history was that? Last 100 years. The 20th century was the greatest revival period of whole church history. Within the last 100 years, more people cannot compare to the, any other period of the church history. More people came to Christ. Then exactly we estimate the whole the, this revival pheno, uh, phenomena. The revival was not even spread within the last 100 years. It was concentrated to the second half of the 20th century. More specifically speaking, after 1970, we, are, we have been experiencing the greatest revival in whole church history. Then, more important thing is that this revival is still going on. Our scope of sight is nearly narrow. So sometimes, my church is growing, my church is enthusiastic, it feels that the whole Christianity seems to be growing and uh, uh, energetic. But my church is not growing at all. It's uh, inactive. It felt like that the whole Christianity seems to be inactive. That's not true. Whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, we are living in the midst of the greatest revival period in the whole church histories. What exciting s What exciting s I want to provide you several statistics for you. In Latin America, actually, 
Latin America calls a kind of uh, optical illusions. It goes, uh, Catholic is uh, counted as Christians. So, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, even the 400 years ago, Latin America was a Christian continent. Then the whole status, number of statics of Christianity was not changed. But inside of that uh, statist, we can find out actual number of Protestant Christians were growing so fast within the last 100 years. In the year of 1900, there was only less than 700,000 Protestant Christians were in Latin America. Iglesia Evangelica, literally translated, it sounds like evangelical churches, but in Latin America it doesn't mean the Protestant Christians altogether. There was only less than 700,000 evangelical Christians, but today there's uh, more than 90 million evangelical Christians right now. Almost a hundred times it doubled. God worked in Latin America in a very special way. For example, I want to give an illustration. Brazil. 1970, 88.6% of uh, Brazilian people were Roman Catholics. Then, today, Almost 30% of the populations are evangelical Christians. You know what does it mean that? Right now in Brazil, there are more evangelical Christians than really practical Catholic believers. So they changed their nation's identity. No longer Brazil is Catholic countries. Many years ago, maybe 1999 summer, I was in Sao Paulo. And uh, at the time I led uh, one meeting over there. Then one of the Korean deacons came to me and said, Professors, you know there's strange things, special things is happening in the Brazil? So I asked him, what kind of special things? He told me that. You know, in Brazil, once they build up the church building, then it's not a matter to uh, pack the church members into the building. Just to complete the building and to put the cross at the roof of the church, without any evangelistic programs, people gather together. After six months later, you cannot see the, you can see the, uh, the uh, things which never dreamed. People gathered together and they literally packed the whole the church seat and even they gathered beside the church window and the church entrance and they get, sit over there and the day just want to participate in the worship service. There was no evangelism explosion. There is no continuing evangelism witness, training witnesses. Just the people are gathering to the churches. Holy Spirit is walking among them. It was true. I visited many places in Brazil, especially in the favela areas. Many people just rush into the churches. Many other countries in Latin America, for example, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Honduras, already exceeded the real number of practical Catholic believers. Those countries are any longer, not a, not no longer the Catholic countries. The winter of 1999, I was in uh, Paraguay, and uh, I joined uh, one evangelist team uh, doing an evangelist crusade in Casal de Nanco. Then they rented uh, one big movie theater. About there's a, about a hundred, uh, one thousand seat was there, and they decided to have an evangelist meeting over there. Then they just uh, displayed uh, several uh, plan card and the post and the uh, radio uh, uh, commercials. 
Then I didn't expect the 1,000 non-Christians gathered together to listen the word of God. Then, really, 1,000 people gathered together. All of them are non-Christian. The preacher who speaks in Espanol preached the word of God. And suddenly, he stretched his hand to this side. Then a group of people fell down. And he stretched his hand to the other side, and another group of people fell down. I saw that kind of scene in the United States in the TV, especially Pentecostal TVs. Then I always said that it, that's not a real thing. They may be under the group pressure. Then that day, I, cannot, I couldn't say so. They, are non, they were non-Christians. Then Holy Spirit came down to them so strongly, they fell down. You know that in these days, literally, Holy Spirit is sweeping over the whole Latin America. Not all, of course. Argentina and Mexico, there's a less response yet. But most of the countries are experiencing the great revival right now in Latin America. Africa. Well, 100 years ago, there was only 7.5 million Christians in all together in, Latin, uh, in Africa. Then, 2010, there's a 500 4 million Christians in the continent of Latin America, uh, Africa. You know that altogether, over the 48% of Africans are Christians right now. During 100 years, the evangelical Christians number were doubled more than 60 times. God has done great thing in Africa. Specifically, Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 63% of the population are Christian. You know, Africa is no longer a dark continent. It's a Christian continent. Currently, at the point of this time, Latin America is the largest Christian continent, no longer the Europe. But five years later, center of Christianity will move to Africa. God is doing great things. Of course, they have a lot of problems. Internal civil war, internal conflict, corruptions, and the poverty. But you know, God is doing special things over there. People are coming back to Christ. And they dedicated their lives. Last year, I visited several churches in South Africa and I preached there. Then I asked one by one, are you saved? Do you have assurance of salvation? Then surprisingly, nine of ten people answered that I'm saved. I have assurance of salvation. Surprising things. God is doing special things in Africa. Then what about Asia? Well, unfortunately, Asia, where we are living, is the least evangelized continent in the world. In Asia, altogether, there's only 8.8 .8 Christians. In this figure includes the number of Catholics even. However, we can find out that the signs of a revival even in this Asia, God is doing special things in Asia. Whenever we talk about the revival in Asia, always many people thought about the Korea. You know that the Korea was the last country in Asia where heard the gospel. Many countries, uh, most of the countries heard the gospel only part of the 19th century, but no missionary came to Korea. 
until the end of the 19th century, 1884-85. Then, once the missionaries stepped in the Korean soil, the gospel spread, and Korean church never stopped to grow more than 100 years continually. It was a miracle. Revival happened, it lasted only 30 years, 40 years in the world. Then Korea revival continued for 100 years. It retarded in 1992, right now. We are not reducing, but our growing rate is heavily retarded. Because of that, Korea has changed. It was the Seoul 200 years ago, or 100 years ago, right now it changed to this kind of stuff. God has done great things. But you know that in these days, only a few people mention Korea as a symbol of a revival because one country come up and shows the greatest, greater revival in Asia. Which country? China. It was unexpected things. China was... Uh, uh, Typically, failed mission field in the 19th century. During the 19th century, no country in the world had received more missionary and more finances from the Western world. But real converters were really handful. Chinese always called the Western missionaries as Western ghost. Nobody come to the Western ghost to be saved. So the uh, Mao Zedong uh, established the PRC, People's Republic of China, in 1949. We believe there were only 1.5 million Christians in China. That was uh, evaluated as a failure. Then, right after the resume of uh, Mao Zedong, Christianity and the Christians reduced very fast. Specifically, in 1964, Cultural Revolution has happened. The greatest victim of a Cultural Revolution was a Christian. So the Red God of a Mouse killed the Christians on the street without any trials. So 1969, world Christians declared that Christian Church, Church of God, disappeared in China. That was the greatest shock to the world Christians. How can the Church of God can be disappeared? Where's God? Where's the Holy Spirit? They were surprised. So the 1970s, many mission councils gathered together and they tried to understand how can it be happened? How can the Church of God can be totally disappeared? Then, you know, 1976, Mao Zedong passed away, and they gradually lifted the bamboo curtain. We can peep into this, what happened inside of China. In 1980, we find out church in China didn't die. Rather, it survived and grew unbelievably. 1969, how many Christians were remained in China? Nobody knows. But we guess they left only the thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of Christians were remained at the time. Then today, I calculated in uh, 1910, the number of Christians surpassed in China. Ten a hundred millions. How can it be? Within 40 years, number of Christians increased from the hundred of thousand to the hundred millions. One thousand times increased. Many people ask the question, what happened in China? What happened in China? Answer is quite simple the Holy Spirit. Within the last 40 years, literally, Holy Spirit 
pour out in China. So the miracles, wonders, signs we can find in the Book of Acts was realized in China within the last 40 years. God has done special things without the assistance of Western missionaries or foreign missionaries. That four years was a terrible dark period for the Chinese churches. No churches, no Bible, no missionaries, but the Holy Spirit walked among them. As we look into the what happened in China, nine, early part of 1970, several young generations uh, stood up as an uh, itinerant evangelist. They were not trained at all. Theological education is needed, but without theological education, it doesn't mean that you cannot work. Holy Spirit utilized them. They gathered together in the remote uh, uh, seminar, uh, the Bible school in the remote areas, and they learned the Bible. Actually, it was not a theological education. They just learned the Bible. But their enthusiasm was so surprised. From the 6 o'clock in the morning to the 10 o'clock in the evening, they continued to learn the Bible. They spent only a week over there, and they scattered to witness Christ. No financial support, no care at all, no destination. They just went to the more remote areas to bring the gospel. And they always spent uh, one night in a certain home, and the next morning they said to like this, I'm a man of God. If you have a sick person, bring them to me. I will pray for them. Fortunately, at those days, every house, every village had a sick person <laughs> in China. <laughs> then, he lay hand and began to pray. And he asked the help of the Holy Spirit. Then miracle happened. They healed. They healed. Then the household was surprised, and the village people were surprised, and people gathered, and the broad mosaic people, he continued to pray for them. Then the Holy Spirit walked among them, and the finery, they presented a very simple gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He already forgiven your sins. Please come to Christ. He will save you. Then once they gained five converters in that village, they formed one small house churches. Then itinerated evangelists had to leave after several days later. Then the one small house church left over there. Then, you know, this church is a really unbelievable situation. They have no one to teach about the, what the Christian life was. They had no one to lead the worship service. Even they had no Bible. Then the itinerant evangelist used to tell them, dear brothers and sisters, you have nothing. But you have only one thing, really. Holy Spirit be with you. Whenever you gather together, trust him and pray for him, he will answer you. That was the only instruction they gave to the house churches. Then Chinese churches, home churches, house churches, gathered together, and they began to pray. Then surprisingly, Holy Spirit answered them. And uh, their prayer was answered, and a miracle happened. Signs and wonders continued to realize among them. Then church began to grow without any leaders. Bible member became the 50, 50 to 500. Sometimes a whole barangay became a Christians. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So we can find uh, so many touching stories from the Chinese Christians. At that time, they really wished to have a Bible. 
But it was almost impossible to have a Bible. Brother Andrew and his team continued to smuggle the Bible outside of China. That was too dangerous. So the Far East Broadcasting Company began to broadcast to read the Bible very slowly. Then they jot down the Bible by the hand. In China, we can see there's so many handwritten Bible this much thick. They listen and uh, jot down the Bible from the Genesis to the Revelation. I know one story of a lady in the uh, uh, countryside. She was uh, saved. Then the, her life was uh, totally changed. He couldn't, she couldn't remain in silence. She got to do some things, but she had to know nothing. So once in a month, she walked to the uh, near towns. This is the first line, but the first fair itself was uh, expensive for her. She walked several hours and go to the town. And she sold her own blood. To the hospital in China, still it is it is able to sell human blood to the hospital. That was the only thing she had, and she received the money, and she purchased a sheet of papers and pencils, and returned to his her home. She spent a night to make a handwritten copy of the Bible, and to spread it to the. Village peoples, and finally, whole villages returned to Christ. One time, I went to the Fanjihua area. That is a remote mountain areas between the Sichuan and the Yunnan areas. It took a really long journey from Beijing. I spent uh, 40 hours in training and seven hours in the bus and uh, four hours uh, by walk. Then, surprisingly, there's a uh, ten small village, mountain villages of a Risu tribe. Ninety percent of them were Christians. Surprisingly, they worship seven days in a week. On Sunday morning, they worship in the morning, just like us. But weekday, every day, gather together around the 9 p.m. in the night time, spend one and one and a half hours to worship together. The first day when I arrived there, they gathered and worship in the um, night time. So I thought maybe they tried to show up their Christian life. The next day, next day, I asked them, "When do you worship?" In a week, they answer me that seven days in a week. Then the one young le- youngsters answer me that, you know, it is the greatest joy for me to worship every day. I believe God will continue to bless the Chinese churches. Then the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is pouring down, pouring out to China. Then you remember that it is a strange illustration. Holy Spirit just like a heavy oil. Heavy oil used to lack of, uh, of uh, I forget that word, uh, volatility. You understand volatility? Uh, gasoline or Airplane fuel has a high volatility, easily burning. But a heavy oil always a lack of a volatility. It needs a lamp with a wick. Then Holy Spirit just like a pour out heavy oil, but it needs a wick or a lamp. It is uh, just the uh, youngsters who dedicate their life. These two conditions were matched. Great revival happened. Nobody believed what happened in China within the last 40 years. But God has done. Many Chinese young generations respond to the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
You know that four years ago, many mission scholars, so-called missionologists, says like this: global evangelization could not achieve within a short time. It will take a long time. Then, after the what ha- they see the what happened in China, they change their word. They say right now like this: if the Holy Spirit pour out in the world, just like in China. World evangelization could be achieved even within one generation. You know that already it was uh, promised in the Bible, Book of Joel in the Old Testament, to twenty eight says like this: And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all peoples. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young young men, your young men will see visions. The book of Joel talk about the the day of the last last day. Then it talk about the two signs of the last day. Number one is that Holy Spirit unexpectedly pour out in the world. Then His people. Begin to dream and have a vision, and they begin to prophesy. What dream? What vision? What prophecies? Maybe God will come back and complete His work. Then must be their dream, their prophecies, and their visions. Holy Spirit pour out in the world. Then things will happen. So. In the day of the Pentecost, Peter saw that the Holy Spirit came down to the, his disciples. They began to speak in tongue. He thought that that was that day, so he quoted the Joel 2:28 in the book of Acts 2:17. Peter said, "In the last day, God says, 'I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will.'" The visions and your, your old man will dream dream. He quoted the j o e s promise, but that was not the that day. But in these days, who are working for the global evangelization, gradually realized that it's not an academic thing; it's just a personal experience. We gradually began to recognize that we seems to be. In the days of Joel prophesied, Holy Spirit is poured out in the world. Holy Spirit is poured out in the world. In so many areas, we found out the Holy Spirit is working among them. Many years ago, I had worked in Venezuela. Venezuela is a beautiful country. Even the former president of Chavez said, "Ruined the whole country, so it's messed up right now." Anyway, 1990s, Venezuela was a real beautiful country and a rich country in Latin America. But spiritually, it is a typical non-harvest field in Latin America. So, in the 1990s, when I decided to serve in Latin、uh, Venezuela for a while. All of my friends told me that, "Hey, brother, why you choose Venezuela? Venezuela is a typical non-harvest field. You you would not gain any、uh, result over there." Anyway, I went over there. Then I found out, Holy Spirit was working among themselves on the street. I did a one-on-one witness evangelism. I couldn't speak Spanish well, just the survival level. So I used the track. One side is English, another side is Spanish. So I read the Spanish. It's easy to read without understanding the meaning, but understand the English text. Then suddenly I witnessed. I could have just one person and just speaking, well, share the word of gospel. A group of people surrounded me, and they listened. Finally, I asked them, "Do you want to believe in Jesus in your life?" And suddenly, a person who stands beside my bed 
responded, "I want to accept Christ." Someone who was standing those、uh, my target people's back answers me, "I want to repent my sin. I want to accept Christ today." Without the work of the Holy Spirit, such things could not be happened. But I found so many people came to Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. One day, I went to the more remote、uh, countryside, Montanita. They call that small town. I preached on the Wednesday night service. There was a small house. I preached to the village people. Then. After my preaching, I did the invitation. Surprisingly, many people responded to the invitation. So they prayed together with me. Then, after I finished the worship service,、uh, I tried to return home. Then, the suddenly, a group of people blocked my way, and they asked me a question, Pastor. Today we accept Christ. Then please tell me at least one thing. What we have to do? I was surprised. Even I worked as a minister for within the last thirty years. That was the first time those who accept Christ just ten minutes ago asked me the question: What should we have to do? Please teach us just one thing. Then I provided them a very typical Baptist answer. The Bible says the first obedience is to be baptized. Please invite the pastor on Sunday, and you to be baptized. Then they answer me. They discuss to themselves in Spanish, and they answer me. If that's a first obedience, pastor. We can do that this night. You are Baptist minister. Please baptize us. I was、uh, totally at a loss. In the mission field, I never wear the suit and tie. Then what happened that night? I wear the suit and tie. So I told them, maybe you do not understand what the baptism is. It's immersing into the water. We need the extra. Clothes and the towels and everything. How can I do in the midnight? Then I never forget their answer. That's not important. We can obey right now. For the first time in my life, in midnight, I put, I went into the Caribbean Sea and I baptized them. They changed their face. They continued to send me a letter. We planted a small church in another town. God bless us. The Holy Spirit is still working among us. Please send us more workers. Please help us. It's just just like a Macedonian calling of the Paul had experience. Come over here and help us. Yes, so many places that they continue to say that. Please come over here and help us. You know that 25 years ago, one of every three person in the world couldn't believe in Jesus Christ because they lived in under the communist regime. Nobody expected the communist regime collapse in a short time. But God's hands touched all the world. Suddenly, the Berlin Wall was collapsed. Soviet Union was collapsed. Things have changed. We never dreamed that、uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia could enjoy the, this kind of religious freedom. Though it's widely open to themselves, even. I never dreamed that the Cambodia, Vietnam, even recent days the、uh, Laos, could open there to the Lord Jesus Christ. We never dreamed, but the Holy Spirit is working among them. 
right after the Cambodia was opened their door to the foreigners, one of the American missionaries sent me a mail. He said, "Dear brother, I have been serving so many countries in the world. I worked for so many different tribes in the world, but I have never met the people who open their heart to the Christ just like the people in Cambodia." Still, it is a Buddhist country. There's a lot of difficulties, but so many people return to Christ. Holy Spirit is working among themselves. Vietnam is a special country. Maybe the work of the Holy Spirit spill over from China to Vietnam. It's just like China. Holy Spirit pour out to them. And many people respond to them just like a lamp. God will revive them. You know that、uh, we are living in the greatest revival period in the church history. What a blessing we have! And also, world situation has changed. The center of Christianity moved from the northern hemisphere to the south southern hemisphere. In mission, in missionology, northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere doesn't mean the geographical meaning, above the equator or below the equator. It doesn't mean that northern hemisphere does means the typical Christian countries, and southern hemisphere was the so-called non-Western countries. But the center of Christianity moved from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemispheres. Nobody expected it. Then a problem. Currently, the 80 percent of Christians, 80 percent of world churches, are located in the southern hemispheres. But you know, you understand what does it mean? It doesn't mean that the non-Westerners、uh, proud themselves of we are the host of Christianity. We have more Christians. We have more Christians. No, it doesn't mean that. Responsibility. Has moved to the southern hemisphere. One generation or two generation ago, our fathers was easy to just point out their fingers to the American missionaries. Here are so many people who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Why you do not send a more missionary over here? They point their fingers to the American churches. Here's、uh, many areas、uh, do not have、uh, churches. Why you do not plant a church over here? But listen, today, 80 percent of the reason why we still have a non-churched area, why we have a non-Christians there, is our responsibility. It is our responsibility, not the American missionaries' responsibility. They did their job in a sense.、And、right now, it is our responsibility. Christianity has changed. Chances are in our hands. Of course, we work together. However, we are living in a very special time in the whole history. We are living in the greatest revival. We are living in a special area. God transfer His responsibility to the hands of ourselves, dear brothers and sisters. God is blessing the Philippines. Your economy is growing right now more than spiritually. God is blessing you. I was so surprised that so many people gather together in this national mission congresses. I didn't expect it. God is doing special things among you. I dare to say, I want to invite you this global endeavors. God is calling you to join hand in this、uh, final task together. Thank you very much.